Sorry, can you? Okay, got it. Oh, there it is. Yeah. There Thank you, you Sage, so, for recording that. Uh, because I'm not there. I'm at, at my office. Um, so welcome, Sage. And uh, I'll hand it over to Sage so she can go over the commercial my NHD, and then she'll hand it over to Rob, and he he can present today's commercial presentation. <laughs> Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming online. And thank you to the three people in person. I appreciate you guys coming over here. Um, so I've been with you guys since the start of my career. Coldwell Banker George Realty is actually the very first office that I got into working for my NHG. So this office is extremely special to me. Um, but today I'm going to hand it off to Rob Noble. He knows the ins and outs of commercial NHG. He's been around for a very long time. He's extremely knowledgeable. So if you guys need anything at all in regards to commercial NHG, residential NHG, I'm here to help. And so is Rob. So I'm going to give the floor to Rob. Thank you. Well, thank you. Being around for a very long time, she just said I was old, <laughs> just so you guys know that. Um, real quick, let me let me go ahead and share my screen before I start. Put my presentation up. And Sage, just uh, make sure. Can you see the presentation? Of course. Yes. And can you still just see the presentation, not my notes? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. And so, so then we're 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 very we're definitely good. Um, well, thank you, Sage, for for that nice introduction, and for Peter and Ruben for allowing me to come into your office. It looks like we've got a great group today. Um, let me move something here. So, a little background on me: um, I have been in the NHD industry, as Sage said, for a very long time. Uh, Twenty three years this May. Um, I started with subdivision in new home, and then I was in the residential. Uh, for disclosures and then for about the eight eight almost nine years now I've been on the commercial side of things and you know in that time I've, I've really seen the disclosures required change quite a bit every year there seems to be something new especially on the residential side right that that gets added to the report you guys have had to deal with AB 38 these new fire maps and home hardening and defensible space um, on the residential side of things this year um, so every year, something really seems to be getting added. And education, we were talking, some of you might not have been on earlier. Um, Ruben was saying education is key. You know, to educate yourself is how you're going to get more comfortable in transitioning over into the commercial side of things. Or if you are a commercial agent, I run into this a lot that they don't even know that NHDs are required for commercial properties. So education is key no matter what you do. So you know, hopefully I don't put anybody to sleep today, but I'm going to educate you on the commercial NHDs. So since I've been on the commercial side of things, I've actually been surprised at how many times I've been asked if commercial NHDs are required here in California. The answer is definitely yes, but um, let me take you through it a little bit. So transactions requiring NHD reports here in California, it's all real property. I mean, Civil Code 1103 makes that very clear. So that includes commercial, industrial, residential, which includes mobile homes, um, vacant land, farmland, and back to mobile homes. A lot of we get this a lot that people think that mobile homes are exempt for some reason, maybe because they're lower cost. They are not exempt. Any real property in California needs a natural hazard disclosure report in some form or fashion. Now the requirements are different, and so that's something we'll go through. So when I've been asked that question by real estate attorneys, and it, it, it amazes me these last nine years that I get questions from attorneys here in California. Now, I understand the ones I talk to from outside of California that say, hey, you know, I don't understand your laws. These aren't required. Right. But I get that question a lot from here in California, from attorneys and also, you know, brokers of record here in California that, you know, what, these are not required or they're adamant that they're not required. And so I send them a couple things. First is an article written after the law was passed in 1998, and this is Civil Code 1103, like I said, that's found in the California Bar Journal. This is the attorney's newsletter, basically. This this really hits home to the attorneys that, you know, that are questioning this, that this is real. Um, and it, once they see this, I pretty much, you know, I don't want to say win the argument, but I educate them that, you know, that this is definitely something that's required. I highlight that both residential and non-residential non properties are required and that it applies to all real estate transactions. So they can see for that for themselves that it is a requirement. 
and not only that, but I also really send home, and you'll probably hear this a couple more times, that this is this is a liability protection either way. This is liability protection for you to protect your clients and yourself by, by allowing us as a third-party provider to give this information to the potential buyer. Um, it, it's on the seller to provide this information by law, and the seller's agent is also required to help them do that. So... Um, this is something that's very, very important for, for liability, for your broker's liability, your own liability, for your seller's liability. Um, it's, it's a protection for you guys, and we take care of that for you. Um, so this uh, highlight, yeah, I, I went over all that, sorry. Another thing I send them, and this really hits home, especially with the residential agents that are kind of transitioning that use CAR documents a lot, is this sale disclosure chart from CAR. Um, I highlight the, the vacant land, commercial and industrial zones, and then I highlight everything below. And, it, you know, I highlight not only what it is, but also what the California government code is and also what the civil codes are. So anybody questioning that can also look it up on their own. This is a this is a great form. You know, it's not just for commercial. If you guys haven't seen this before, um, go to your sales disclosure information on CAR and you can pull it up. It, it'll list everything that's required for residential, it'll list everything that's required required for commercial and mobile homes with the car form publications that you need, et cetera. So it's really a great information piece that they put together, but that's the additional thing that I, that I send them um, to kind of help the, the conversation to educate them that uh, uh, what the requirements are for commercial here in California. So for commercial sales in California, there are only six mandatory disclosures required by civil code. There's so many more for residential, right? So that's that's always been a kind of a crazy thought in my head. But it's 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 really it's really still buyer beware. Do your due diligence. Know what you're buying. That's kind of the commercial mentality. Even in the legislature here in California, it's something that you know they require a lot more things on the residential side of things. <clears throat> they do not require on commercial. Um, so for for per the law. There are only the six mandatory disclosures that are required by civil code, not changed in over the last 20 plus years. They are exactly the same as residential. It's basically the six statutory disclosures that you see on every residential and commercial. If you if you've gotten the commercial report, it, it's your special flood hazard areas, your potential flooding, your earthquake zones. Those six statutory state mapped out disclosures are the only required disclosures for commercial sales. So now does that remove you from liability if, if something's not mandatory and, you know, there's other maps out there and other things that, you know, could be disclosed? No. And that's, and that's why we're here, you know, over at MyNHD to make sure that you know what's also available. Even though it's not required by law, there's lawsuits out there. There's lawsuits for non-disclosure. The number one reason for lawsuits in, in our real estate industry is non-disclosure issues, either from actual knowledge or disclosures weren't provided. And case law has been made that, oh, you know, those are not mandatory to disclose. You know, civil code doesn't mandate that. The judge and juries have come back and said, the information is available. You as the agent are the expert in, you know, Alhambra or, you know, El Monte, LA, wherever your, your local area is. You should have known that these, these other maps, even though they're not mandatory, were available. And that they're approved maps and you should have used them, uh, you should have disclosed them or you should have provided, used a third party provider that would have, you know, provided that information. Now, we think it's a little bit out there that you as the agent, you as the broker, even though you are the, the, the resident expert of that area, should have known that this local map was available for Alhambra or wherever it that's that's kind of our job that's that's what our you know industry is about we get these maps we look up the approved information and we put we put a lot of things in our reports that are not mandatory to disclose specifically for that reason and that's to protect you and your clients from liability so just remember just so just because something is not mandatory to disclose does not mean you absolve yourself from liability So in the interest of time, in the interest of time, let me briefly go through these six mandatory disclosures and how they look. Very similar to what you're going to see on your residential side of things. These are the, the mandatory disclosures on the residential and commercial, but only mandatory on commercial. 
You have your flood hazard areas. These are based on 1% annual chance of being flooded with water at least one foot deep from severe storms, often referred to as the 100 year flood zones. Now these are mapped out by the state and federal government, FEMA flood zones. Um, here you can see an exact copy. We use, we use over at MyNHD, we use aerial mapping, which is very, very precise and very cool looking, I would say. Um, you can see the property there in green. And then we have parcel level data that shows, you know, all the parcels and the houses. And then we highlight it in green and then show the flood layer or whichever layer it is uh, overlapping it. So you can see exactly how it's been mapped out and also the aerial footage of the actual neighborhood and the property that you see. So very cool technology that we've been using in the last few years that nobody else uses. So hopefully you guys appreciate that as well. So what do you do if you're in a special flood hazard area? Well, if the property requires a mortgage to close, the escrow is probably, I'm sorry, the escrow, to close escrow, the buyer is probably going to be required to purchase flood insurance. The, if there's going to be a lender on the deal and it's in a flood zone and the structure has not been pulled out, if the actual structure has not been pulled out of the flood zone with a flood, uh, a flood certification, the lender is probably going to require flood insurance. And if you if you don't know, that's that's probably going to be very expensive, and it's going to add to the overall you know amount of money that person needs each month to cover it. And so that's going to change some of the financials for that loan, right? You know, can they cover that much more with that flood insurance being added to it? So have your buyer, and you'll hear this a couple times probably. Always have your buyer, whether they're if they're wondering if they can build an ADU uh, or something else, a pool or a structure on their property, and they want to, you know, contact the city or they're contacting insurance companies because of flood zones, you always want to have your buyer do it. Um, we've we've seen some disasters kind of where um, you know the agent just just trying to be helpful because that's 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 our job, right? To be helpful and to try and get all the information for our clients. We go to the city or we go to the insurance company. We try and get information. And, and sometimes we provide wrong, wrong information. And that can come back to bite, you know, the agent and the broker. Um, so always, always have to make sure the buyer, you can give them the information, the phone number, websites, but have them contact the insurance company to determine what the insurance requirements and premiums are going to be. And if anybody has any questions, um, please don't hesitate. Um, I'm not sure, Ruben, if you want them to wait or if you want them to throw it into the chat or however, but I'm good either way. Uh, no, Rob, that's up to you. If you want to be uh, interactive or you want them to wait, you you make that call. Yeah, I'm, I love interaction. So if you guys have a question, please interrupt me. I, I won't take any offense. Just go ahead and speak up or do a little hand thing on the thing and we'll, we'll get right to you. Uh, Rob, I do have a question right now. Yes, Peter. Uh, is is an uh, endangered species uh, like yellow butterfly considered to be uh, part of the NHD? So the endangered species. So there's a couple companies out there that that list like the the red tree legged frog, and then list everywhere it's supposed to be. There's there's a there's a problem with trying to list each endangered species because the report would go probably over 150 pages, Peter. Um, there's so many endangered species for each area that most companies now provide just an advisory saying, you know, there, there may or may not be endangered species in the area. Go to this link, put in the property address, and you will be advised if there is endangered species for this area. Um, because so, there's, there's, there's thousands of the endangered species now, right? So yeah. it's, it's really hard to track through a database and, and put them into a report like that because it's it would get very very extreme. So it's not it's not cost effective or time effective. Okay, what I mean is uh, if you if you have uh, your NHT and then uh, you just disclose to them that there might be a uh, uh, endangered species, would would that uh, uh, satisfy your, your, uh, the requirement of disclosure? Y yes, because number one, it's it's. It's 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 not like mandatory disclose, but it is it is a liability thing, right? That yeah. So the, so the advisory does that in effect by saying, we as the agent have advised you that there may or may not be, you know, endangered species in the area. Please do your own research before buying this property. Go to this link if this is something you are concerned with, and they have to do their own research on it. There's there's just. It. There's just absolutely no way anybody can can track individual species anymore. It's just there's just too many of them. Yeah, I see. If that makes well, sense. You, can I chime in? So, so yes. routinely, you you do that on the uh, NHD to alert them uh, the the owners or the buyers that uh, 
there might be some possibility of uh, endangered species. Yes. Right, uh, Rob? Page, not a page, Sage. <laughs> 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 I don't know where that came from. <laughs> yeah, no, on the NHG, there will be a critical habitats, and then we'll put a yes or a no, but it mm. is up to the agent or whoever's buying the house to do their due diligence and look into that further. That's why Rob is saying there's going to be a link to follow up on whatever that critical habitat could be, regardless if it's a butterfly, if it's a plant, if it's a specific type of animal. But I think what's important is say that the buyer is living somewhere with Joshua trees and it has, and it's considered an endangered plant, an endangered tree, right? Mm -hmm. If they're selling it, but there's nothing known to the seller and they're just choosing not to tell the seller, hey, like, Someone may come around and tell you you're not allowed to get rid of these Joshua trees. That's why non-disclosures is the biggest lawsuit, because if a seller is choosing, hey, I just don't care enough to tell the buyer that someone may come around and talk about these Joshua trees, they're going to come back and they're going to sue the agent. Yeah. See, some, some of the, uh, even the seller may not be aware of the, the endangered species, you know? And then if they're selling the land and later on uh, the buyer can find out that they cannot develop because of the uh, endangered species, uh, you may have big losses, you know, so. Yeah. But I've also be had this question that. before, and if for any reason you guys have any agents that are concerned about a specific thing, I've gone to our customer support team, they are amazing, and they've done the research and they've called that specific city and they try to get information. We're doing our best to help you guys. And so if you do happen to have a situation where you have an agent that is confused about a very specific critical habitat, we will do what we can on our end and we'll help you figure it out. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Sage or Paige. <laughs> uh, so, so the second one, moving on. So the second one is the area of potential flooding. And this gets confused with the first one, the FEMA flood zone a lot. We get questions on this all the time. It's like, wait a minute, I'm not in a flood zone. We've actually said, no, they're not in a flood zone, but we said, yes, they're in an area of potential flooding. And I think it's the word flooding that really gets people confused. They think this one has to do with flood insurance as well, but it doesn't. And area of potential flooding is about the potential for dam failure. Um, it has everything to do with if, if a dam were to fail and it's at full capacity, you know, that has not been something that's been a concern for quite a while here in California because of our drought situation. Um, but these, you know, geez, 10, 11 years ago, I live in Riverside County, right where Prado Dam is, right where the 91 and 71 come together and it almost failed. And Prado Dam was built to basically protect Orange County Santa Ana Canyon, basically, um, it stopped that water from going in there and doing all that flooding. But if that were to fail and it was at full capacity, that water would reach all the way to the ocean in Long Beach. That's that's how big and catastrophic these dam failures could be. But flood insurance, if it says yes to the second one, flood insurance is not going to be required by a lender. All right. It's it's not something that is a very it's not something that's going to happen often like flood flooding and fires those happen often a dam failure the potential is not high for it to be for that sort of catastrophe but if somebody is concerned you know this is our aerial mapping again and, and right here on uh stone canyon stone canyon stone canyon if they if that if they were that looks like a nice property they were concerned they're right in the middle of this this map if that dam were to fail that they can go personally purchase flood insurance on their own. It's it's a total voluntary issue. A lender will never require flood insurance for a dam inundation zone. So that's that's sometimes where people get confused. So that's the second one that's mandatory to disclose. And then you have your high fire and your wildland fire zones, um, commonly referred to as the Bates Bill for the the very high fire. Property owners within these zones are required to clear tree limbs from within ten feet of any chimneys and stove pipes. Prune tree, tree limbs and clear leaves, use class A roofs. And, and the big one is clearing the vegetation from around the structures. Now, this these, these zones have actually gotten a lot more stricter here in the last year and a half, um, especially with the invention of AB 38 um, for the residential properties. Um, we have the Rancho Cucamonga, for example, is, is very, very strict on these zones. 
Uh, people are not being able to sell their properties because they they put in like twenty thousand dollars worth of nice landscaping and sage palms and and palm tree, queen palms and stuff. They're basically being told they have to rip them out. And people are not buying these properties now because of these these nice, beautiful, expensive landscaping that people have done. And you know these things are are, are happening all the time now. So you might run into that. But high fire and wildland fire zones are really both high fire zones. It's really just talking about who's going to come put out the fire. The high fire areas are your urban areas, so it's your local fire departments. And the wildland areas, just like it sounds, are your your more rural areas, and that's going to be the California Department of, Department of Forestry. So these maps are constantly changing. Um, they're changing um, not on a daily basis, but based off of fires that happen. So a property might not have been in a zone that is in a zone now or vice versa, but it's typically that first one, you know, it wasn't in a fire zone and now it is. And we've been seeing this a lot more too. If, if we say you're not in one of these zones or even a local or county zone, sometimes the insurance company, they're making, they're using their own maps. So even though we have to do what is required by law and, you know, give you the approved maps, but even though we say you're not in a fire zone, that insurance company might still require a higher premium or might not even insure the property due to their mapping system. They're, they're going above and beyond some of these fire maps sometimes where they're like, whoa, either for a liability reason or to increase their premiums, they're using their own maps. So um, we get that call and say, hey, I'm being excluded from insurance because I'm in a zone, but you guys told me we're not. We'll double check everything, make sure that we were correct. But um, that 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 has that has happened. Yeah, Ruben. Uh, Rob, do you do you see that these fire zones are constantly ex expanding or or changing, updating um, in your opinion? In California, that is. So like yes, yes, they are. But it's it's not like we're not getting a, a new map every day. But it, it used to be we used to get new mapping like once every like five to eight years. A new map would come out from the city or from the state or whatever. Um, <laughs> now we can get a new map in like, say, six months, you know, um, which is which is important. Another point I usually bring up the end. But if, if something if your property is taking like three to five months and with commercial right it could take a year to sell a property sometimes we always we always want you to get the information up front when you get your listing there's no risk to you or your client to not have this information you should know up front before you get to escrow don't let escrow order this even though they're awesome and everything you should know this information when you have your listing is it in a flood zone is there going to be any insurance requirements for fire zones and then on the commercial side especially when i get to it there's there's environmental issues that aren't really talked about with residential. Uh, commercial has environmental issues. You know, there's site inspections. There's things a buyer's got to do. But we provide you up front with that information. You know, is anything being monitored by the state or federal government on the property or surrounding the property up to a mile? There's it's We call it a red flag report or a pre-phase one report. It's something that you should know before you get to escrow because that's this is a right of rescission document, you know, like a lot of other things. But you don't want to wait until you get to escrow, have all that blood, sweat, tears, and money invested in this property, have escrow order this for you as a, a service that they do. And then that buyer sees something in the environmental report. There's a chemical company a quarter of a mile away that's releasing chemicals into the air that, you know, that's being cleaned up right now or or chemicals into the, the soil and groundwater. You know, you just want to have this information up front. It costs you nothing. We don't we don't require payment until it closes and there's no cancellation fees. So why not get this information up front so you can see all the red flags that are potential here? We see a lot of problems. People allow an escrow to order it and then the buyer either uses it as a way to back out of the deal because of buyer's remorse or they actually see something they don't like. They see something that scares them or something that's going to affect what they want to do with the property. Um, it's, it's just always better to know this up front order at the time you get the listing. But what started this is that we do free updates for you. So if it's taking, if it's taking five, six months, if it's taking a year, you know, we always say if it's taking three months, just, just give us a call. We want to make sure that there's no updates to the maps that have changed. It's a free update. It takes, it takes like a couple minutes. Just give us a call, call Sage, call me. 
We'll put it, we'll double check everything, put a new date on it and re-email it to you just so you have a fresh updated copy. We know things sometimes take longer, especially in the commercial world. We'll do free updates for you, but have that information up front so you know the potential red flags or challenges that could, you know, affect that property. So hopefully that kind of makes sense for everybody too. So these are high fire and wildland fire zones. What do you do if you're in these, these two zones? It's definitely, we're seeing this all the time, difficult for the buyer to obtain property insurance and property insurance will be expensive in there if they're in these zones. Have your buyer, have your buyer contact the insurance companies to determine number one, if they can get insurance and number two, you know, what the premiums are. And we also see the people that, you know, can't get insurance. California has a fair plan act that. Can, can, can everybody mute themselves, please? Okay. Thank you. Um, the California fair plan is, is a website and a, and a, a thing that California put together for the people that can't get fire insurance through the regular insurance brokerages. So www.cfpnet.com is the California fair plan and people that can't get insurance can go there to get help to get insurance for the property. So that's a resource for people. And that that's for Cal that's for commercial properties. That's for commercial and residential. Got it. So. Um, Rob. Yes, Peter. I have a question. Yeah, what 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 is the extent of um, uh, fiduciary duty of uh, the agents uh, in in terms of informing uh, the buyer about the uh, the fire zones and uh, the necessity of getting the 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 fire uh, insurance? The fiduciary duty is providing yeah. them with with this information. What is the extent? You know, in other words, uh, you know, of course, you you have the uh, NHD for. The, the bias to reveal, but it is how what is the extent of your explanation to them to make sure that they understand it and and, and they uh, they act accordingly, you know? Because some, you know, some of the agents say, hey, this is the NHD report. So uh, uh, why don't you read it and then see if it's satisfactory to you, you know? Yeah, so there's been there's been some lawsuits on that too, where you know a buyer has come back and said yeah, my agent just said sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here, and the deal was closed. They did not explain anything to me. The most important thing that I can say about that is that you need to go through these. I know that we're a very, you know, non-exciting, very small part of, you know, this stack of paperwork that you're putting together to close these deals, but we are a mandatory and important part as well. Um, lawsuits definitely happen because of non-disclosures of NHDs or non-explanation by the agent on NHDs. Um, you know, people get their feelings hurt. They didn't like something about the property, you know, whatever the reason they want to file a lawsuit, they will use an NHD not being explained to them as part of it. Um, you really need to go through it and you really need to make sure anything that they are in, you talk to them about before they sign it. If they're in a fire zone, this is showing you that you're in a fire zone. And on the residential side, you're going to have some things you have to do. You know, on the residential side, you have a law called AB 38. So you're going to have defensible space. You're going to have your home hardening things that you have to do to make sure that that residence is, you know, protected from fires as much as possible. If you don't explain to them the NHD, if you just have them sign, 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 and that's probably with a lot of things, any other settlement service that, that's being used in the, in the deal, you're as an agent, you're opening yourself and your brokerage up to a potential lawsuit if they want to come back and, and say something about it. So your fiduciary duty is to disclose, number one, provide that NHD report, and then number two, as the agent, your duty is to go through it with them. So... If you don't, then, like I said, you're opening yourself up. Yes, Ruben. Um, so for those agents that are not as knowledgeable with these type of reports mm -hmm. or are just uncomfortable explaining these reports to their buyers, um, is there a service that my NHD um, provides or maybe perhaps uh, Sage that they can contact Sage to see if there's any red flags that should be dis explained or if, you know, the report looks pretty, pretty uh, uh, simple and nothing really red flag to disclose. Uh, that way it'll allow the agents to get a little bit more comfortable with the reports um, versus just not reviewing it at all. 
Um, I can speak on that. I have done classes going over this fire hardy and defenseless space form. It's intentionally confusing. They've changed it like three times already. They're probably going to change it again. And I will go over it. I have gone over it with buyers before with the agents. I've even recommended that the agents go to CAR and go to attorneys so that they can get more help with it. Even the CAR attorneys are like, I can't help you. So the best thing that you can do as an agent is really buckle down, get the seller and the buyer to sit down and look at this form because they both have to agree to it. They both have to say, hey, should I sign this? And then we can get the defenseless space inspection a year after close of escrow. If they happen to live in Big Bear, Lake Arrowhead, where they probably already have a defenseless space inspection in place because they do live in a area that has a lot of brush, a lot of trees, they probably already have a defenseless space inspection in place. That's a question to be asking the seller. So if you guys have any agents that are very confused about this form, if you do have to fill it out, I'm more than happy to help because it is confusing. It's not fun, but I have done classes about it before and I have spoken to buyers about this. So if you do need the help, I am more than happy to help. But yeah. at the end of the day, it's not anybody else's. Nobody else is signing it other than the buyer and the seller. And I believe that actually, no, a couple agents are signing it too. Yeah. But it's an agreement between the seller and the buyer. So they really need to sit down and understand it. And, and Ruben, to your point too, it's and the AB38 is the most confusing issue right now for residential agents. So that's why Sage is speaking to that. But But overall... It's the agent's job to go through the report with their, their client and say, look, it says you're in this fire zone or you're in this flood zone. If the agent doesn't have the answer to any additional questions that their client may have, that's where we come in. OK, that's our that's our service, our continued service, even after we provide the report that that agent can call and say, I don't understand this. Can you help me, Sage? Rob, this this commercial environmental. What is what does this mean? I can get my I can get my geologist on the phone with your clients um, to explain the environmental impact or concerns that this monitoring is going on for this environmental concern for this commercial property. Um, we will, we will explain what it means for, you know, this certain disclosure. We will try to do our best to answer, you know, your client's questions. Uh, we'll talk directly to them. Um, Perfect. The, the new sage and most of us, you know, we do new agent trainings a lot too. So especially when you have new agents, you know, get them together, schedule a class. That kind of helps with the first part of that education, right? A new agent training for NHDs. Um, that's something that, you know, you guys can schedule as well. Um, I'm sure Sage would be more than happy to do that. Yeah, I can do just a residential NHD class, but to speak more about these fire zones, the fire hardy defenseless space advisory, something great that my NHD does is if you are required to fill out the CAR form, Fire Hardy Defenseless Space Advisory, if you order a My NHG report, it's going to tell you straight up AB 38 notice, what to do next. How do you know that you have to fill it out? If you're a residential property, one to four units, the home was built before 2010, and it's located in a high or very high fire zone. We tell you straight up, this is what you need to do next. We give you the link to request a defenseless space inspection. And we give you a local fire department's telephone number and address in case it is not in Cal Fire's jurisdiction. So that's something that you guys should utilize when using a My NHG report is, hey, am I in a high fire zone and what do I need to do next? Because I've had agents that call me and they thank me because we made it so much easier for them because we gave them the not only Cal Fire's information, but that local fire department's information as well. So, so just to uh, reiterate, uh, just to uh, finalize that. So for commercial properties too, the MyNHD for commercial properties, uh, that referral will still go to you, Sage? Yeah. Okay. Everything will go to me, but if there's a very specific question about commercial that I'm not familiar with, I'll call Rob. Or if you guys are like, hey, um, I really got on with Rob. I really liked what he was saying. I'm just going to call him really quick because he seems like he knows what he's talking about. Go for it. You can call him. I won't mind. 
yeah, so we're, we're all teammates, right? yeah we're all a team here at my NHG it's not oh mine his we all work together so whatever you feel more comfortable with you can always come to me I'm the person that you guys are going to see in person but if you want to talk to Rob directly go for it perfect thank yeah. you You'll have my information at the end of here. Um, definitely call me directly, call Sage. Either way, we're, we're your resources for this. So, um, all right. So earthquake fault zones is another one that's residential and commercial. It's our cross the bear, right? You know, you know, East Coast has their hurricanes, Midwest, the tornadoes. We get a lot of out-of-state people that are really worried about earthquakes. Um, I've seen the state maps. They're, they're everywhere. Um, there's small ones, large ones, huge ones like San Andreas medium ones they're all over the place they're constantly hitting us whether we're feeling them or not they're constantly quaking and going off so it's just kind of we just need to talk our clients through it right we need to talk your client through it and just say you know what they're they're it's california's thing it's they're all over the place you know modern construction really has a lot of that building code stuff for you know the foundations and stuff to deal with this california it, newer construction in the last 15 years has really been focused on you know, if an earthquake hits how is this building going to shift is it going to sink is it going to crumble you know so there's a lot of things in place for new 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 construction if it's older construction then you know some of those concerns may be valid uh residential or commercial um so it's it's just we just need to walk them through it hold their hand it's our cross the bear like i said here in california um, earthquake fault zones disclose potential for fault rupture and fault creep fault ruptures when earthquake hits and that ground instantaneously ruptures across fault creep is you know you start seeing cracks in your walls you know the ground has slowly started expanding over the years so that's called fault creep so that's what's mapped out and they basically take that rupture zone and they go 500 feet on each side of that rupture zone and that's what is called the the earthquake fault zone so that's that's how they map it up. So if the rupture is only this big, they're going to go 500 feet on each wide. If it's you know a mile wide, they're going to go 500 feet on each side of that, and that's going to be the fault zone. Now, just because our disclosure report says you are not in earthquake fault zone, you're probably pretty close to one. You know, just for your own knowledge, it's it's they're they're not very far away from us. Like I said, they're all over the place, big, small, medium ones, but um, they're going to be around. If you're in a fault earthquake fault zone. Well, certain things, well, let me let me go through the next the next couple slides first and I'll talk about that. You also have your state landslide zone. So earthquake induced landslides and you do, you do not have to be on the slopes of Malibu to be in a landslide zone. You know, those are the ones we see on the news, you know, um, you know, highway one is closed for two years because up there in Santa Barbara, it, you don't, you don't have to be on a slope. It, it can be very, very gradual. So they map this out where um, those occurrences could happen based off of the topography of that of that slope, and also where previous previous occurrences of landslide may have occurred. So again, we have our aerial mapping that'll show you, you know, the property here in green, and you have a landslide zone going right through it. You also have your liquefaction areas. So this is also a geologic thing, along with landslide and earthquake. This is areas of where the historical occurrence of liquefaction is there, or it, it's present and it could happen. Liquefaction is a quicksand-like effect. So basically when that earthquake hits, that structure has potential to sink. So it's a, it's a, a quicksand-like effect that can take place in the soil. So for liquefaction to occur, you need an earthquake, you need sandy soils and saturated soils. Now for these two areas, liquefaction and landslide, only 20 to 25% of the state has been mapped. That's why on that signature page, that statutory page, it's the only one that says yes, no, or map not yet available by the state. That's the only one. Everything else is yes or no. It's been mapped. The whole state's been mapped. But, geez, Riverside County 11 years ago was supposed to be mapped, and they still haven't gotten around to doing it yet. And these are state resources or, you know, environmentalists or, you know, whatever is blocking the mapping from happening. 20 to 25% of the state has not been mapped. So this, this is where this comes up. And this started about 15 years ago in San Diego County, local city and county areas started mapping out their own backyards. And it started down San Diego County. We, as an industry, we couldn't even do business in San Diego unless we provided this eight page report that San Diego put out, a Sanjus report that basically mapped out liquefaction and landslide because they knew there were liability issues. They knew there were 
issues with buyers potentially buying things in these areas and not being told about it. So the local government, city and county, have started out mapping their own areas. So we started providing those in our report, number one, because we had to in San Diego County. But as a company, we, we saw, yeah, this is a liability issue. This is not mandatory to disclose for, for liquefaction or landslide in a local or city county. It's not mandatory to disclose, but lawsuits happen, right? So that, that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. Even though it's not mandatory, it's an available map. It's been approved by the, the general counsel, that safety element, that safety element of the general, the general counsel for that county. That's something we're going to put in our, our map, our mapping, our disclosure report to protect you, your clients from liability issues. And also us, you know, if somebody files a lawsuit, they, they can name everybody in the deal, right? And I'll talk about terms and conditions later, but they can name escrow, they can name the broker, the agent, you know, the settlement service, you know, that provided a report that didn't specify something that didn't have local information. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're protecting you guys with everything that's available, even if it's not mandatory. So what happens if you're in one of these three zones, earthquake, fault zone, landslide, liquefaction? Being in these zones can def definitely affect new construction costs. You have that vacant land that you want to go ahead and, you know, put this pretty uh, commercial industrial complex on top of. Well, if you're in one of these zones, they may tell you no. Um, so knowing this information is going to be very, very important. Your buyer may not be able to build. And if they are able to build, if they allow the building, the construction codes and costs will be significant. Um, because of the leaps and hurdles that they must go through to mitigate these three things or to try and mitigate these three things. So again, if they're interested in building something, have your buyer contact contact the city or county offices to to find out what the restrictions are. Can I chime in with this? Yeah. Sorry, this is so, uh -uh. so important because if you're representing a buyer and you tell them absolutely, you can build a pool, you can build an ADU, go for it. And then after the close of escrow, they go to the city and they try to get the permits to build. And they say, no, you can't build because you're in an earthquake fault zone. That's going to come back on you guys as agents. So this is so, so important. And that's why it's so it's so essential to order your NHG right at listing and see if you are in any of these zones. Yeah, I agree. You know, a lot of a lot of, a lot of people, you know, sometimes think that, Again, small part, not very important. It's something I need for my deal. Let's sign, 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 sign here. And then, you know, not explain anything like we were talking about earlier, Ruben and Peter. And it can come back to bite them, bite them in the the, the wrong area. So um, very, very important to know about this stuff up front. Um, I, I can't emphasize it enough, like like Sage says. So so please. Yes, Peter. Yeah. So, Rob, you know, it yeah, even affects the, uh, the existing building. Like uh, you already had, um, you know, uh, a home there, and then you are trying to build as an ADU. Those, uh, those earthquake fault, landslide, and li liquefaction zones will come into play when you want to have some, um, you know, new construction, right? Correct. Even yeah, even so with an existing structure on the parcel, if you want to build that ADU, that additional thing, or like say, said a pool or an entertainment structure in the backyard um, that needs to be permitted, you know, they're, they're going to tell you no, maybe if you're in one of these zones. Mm, so it's yes. very important. Interesting. Interesting. Very, very important because, to disclose this. Yeah. Because uh, fire would, would think that, you know, if, since you're already, already able to build a house there and ha having an additional um, construction like an ADU, probably would not be subject to, um, to a scrutiny like, you know, the, the new constructions. Right. But, you know, say, say it's the house that say it's a house that's built on the property already. There might have been um, building oh, code, cool. building codes and things that they did yeah, to yeah. mitigate, you know, the, in the foundation, that structure, that a pool or something else. What I do, they're going to say no to. Oh, so and, and it could also be that when that house was built, it was not in a liquefaction zone yeah. and the maps have been updated. And now that property is in a liquefaction zone. So things can change, too. But the most important part is that it, if it is one in one of these zones, it can affect an additional build or a new build. And the buyer needs to know that. So. So is it safe to say that if you're planning to do an ADU after the acquisition of the, the property, you should check with the, the city and find out. All the details, uh, whether you can you can build on it or 
what yep. are the code uh, requirements? Absolutely. You're, you're, you as the agent should recommend absolutely. And, and it should be a, maybe a standard question that your agents ask people, you know, are you planning, you know, if it's a, if it's vacant land, of course, they're probably planning to build, but if yeah. it's, if it's a, an existing structure, say, are you, are you, are you have any plans down the road to do an ADU or build a pool or whatever? If so, this is in an earthquake fault zone or a landslide liquefaction zone. It, you you really need to go and ask the city or county if your if this parcel is okay to do what you're planning to do. So it it, it just might be a standard question that agents should be asking yeah, people. I think it's a good idea because right now the government encourages you to do the ADU and a lot of buyers knows that, but then you know they will be surprised if they find out that uh, after all. They cannot build the ADU and they'll blame it on the agent, you know. They will. They blame it on the agent and the agent hangs their license with the brokerage. So they're not <laughs> the only ones being pulled in, right? So <laughs> yeah. it affects, it, it does affect a lot of people, right? right. Um, so very, very important, like Sage said, definitely make sure that they're calling the city. It, it, make sure they're even asking the question in the beginning. Do you have any plans to build anything else on this yeah. property? You need you really need to find out because it's in a liquefaction or a landslide or an earthquake zone. You really need to go ask the city if they're going to allow that before you decide to purchase this property. Right. right. Good idea. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. And then, sorry, just one more thing. I was just telling um the ladies here that if they don't want to talk to the buyer, I'll do it for them, and I'll make it abundantly clear that they need to. They understand that they potentially cannot build if they are are on an earthquake fault zone. So if you don't want to talk to them, I'll talk to them. Yeah, and, and that and that once that conversation happens, it's their responsibility. Your agent or the disclosure report, us as the reps for the disclosure company, we have informed the buyer that there's a potential you cannot build on this parcel if you purchase it because it's in one of these zones. Now the liability has shifted to them. It's now on that buyer to go do the investigation. The liability has been taken off of the agent, the brokerage, you know, us, because it has been disclosed and we have advised, you have advised them to talk to the city or county to make sure that they can do this. And I would actually, as an agent, you know, in this litigious, you know, world we live in, especially here in California, I would actually notate that on the disclosure form itself that we had the conversation buyer to contact the city and, you know, city or county regarding that. Yeah, Ruben. Yeah, so just for our agents, make sure you document that. If you have a conversation with your buyer or seller, you know, uh, regarding any of these disclosures, um, you know, in the in the eye of the court, there it's going to be he said, she said, unless you have it documented. So you could put in an addendum stating that you've disclosed this to the to the buyers, and they still want to go and proceed to purchase the property and stuff. So. Uh, don't leave it just just by conversation alone. Yeah, whether whether it's you know you notate that directly on the liquefaction or whichever page it is, and have them initial it that you advise them to talk to the city about additional buildings or like Ruben says, putting a, an addendum in. Just having that, just having that, it's a protection for you. He said, she said, verbally, it's it's something that's probably never going to protect you in a court of law. Judge is not going to know which way to go, not who to believe. You got to have documentation. So document, document, document. So, uh, so we've talked about this a little bit. So what else is in the commercial report and also in the residential? But some of this stuff is required for residential, right? Like that AB 38 local fire mapping, local disclosures, not required by commercial at all. Only those six things we just talked about are required by law. And that's why... 99.9 .9, there's one other company that that doesn't do it i think but 99.9 .9 of disclosure companies they take the word commercial and they slap it on their residential report and say this is this is our commercial report and that's because they are providing those six statutory things that's also required on the residential right liquefaction landslide flood fire and they're calling it a commercial report and they don't provide anything else that's commercial centric so just be aware that most companies don't have a true commercial report. They're just re they're just giving you the residential because it satisfies the mandatory requirements by law. OK, so additional things that aren't required, you know, certain counties and cities require their own local disclosures that they do. We have them in our report. AB 38, just because it's required, these local maps, these fire maps, just because it's required only a residential 
We still put in our commercial report. We believe and we hear that AB 38 is also going to transition over to the commercial side of things because, you know, these big fires didn't just like jump over the commercial buildings and just burn residential. They burned a big swath of commercial and industrial and farmland as well. So um, they're definitely looking at making AB 38 part of the commercial disclosures as well. We already did that. They're already in our reports. It's already notated in red, just like it is on the red residential. If it's in an AB 38, you're going to see it on the summary page. It's going to be there. It's going to disclose that. Um, you know, there's going to be, there's not going to be defensible space. There's going to be defensible space, especially in the rural areas. Um, Department of Forestry, you know, if you're up in Big Bear, for an example, and it's a, it's a commercial industrial, they're going to make sure that that foliage and the, the trees are trimmed way back from the structure that defensible space is still going to be in place, but it's not mandatory like it is with residential. You know, the different the different institutions, the firehouses or Department of Forestry may mandate it themselves, and the local city and county governments may mandate it themselves. But it's not a requirement for disclosure. But we're gonna we're gonna make sure that the liability is off you on the commercial side. Either way, we're gonna have that information on a report. So we provide the local data to address these needs. Um, we already talked about this. Local hazard zones can affect construction costs and permitting. And failure to disclose, like we, we talked about also, this local data can create liability. The information is available, not mandatory to disclose. It, it doesn't protect you from liability. Um, and local data can be used where the state and federal maps have not been created. So that, that Riverside County not be a map for liquefaction and landslide, a great example. And you're going to see this too. I know I keep saying that word. You're going to see this. But um, say say on the, the state mapping, the fire zone, it says you're not in a fire zone. And then the city and county, that section says you are in a fire zone. We get this a lot. And that could be in flood zones, fire zones, earthquake fault zones. A lot of times the state maps out something and the city and county also maps out something. And a lot of times they're going to differ. The state says you're not in something and the city and county says, you know what, you are in this, this fire zone. You are in this earthquake fault zone. People say, well, who's right? Well, we definitely side with the local government. Um, we have to provide what's an approved map, what's been mapped out. And when these when these differences happen, people ask who's right. If it's the same sort of disclosure, earthquake fault zone, and the, the local governments are saying you're in or out, we, we side with them. Um, this is their own backyard, uh, especially if the state hasn't gotten around to mapping anything. You know, they're they're more invested in what's going on in their local community, right? They probably have more people in something than out of a out of a disclosure, but we definitely side with the local government. But you will see where that that they will conflict sometimes on the same sort of mapping. Um, so just know you you could see that. Um, just a local, just some visuals here. San Bernardino County flood map it looks very similar to what the federal and state do for their for their FEMA flood mapping. Um, kind of the different zones. You have to be in a zone A like Apple or B like Victor to be in a uh, a, a flood zone that's going to require flood insurance. So there's about six, seven different zones, but only A or V are the the high the high flood zones. And just a copy, and this needs to be updated, uh, unfortunately, because of how many fires that have been going on. But this is the Orange County fire fire map, um, the local one. And you can kind of see where the very high, high fire zones were originally kind of more in the mountainous areas and not more in the rural areas where that's kind of been changing a lot. And the new mapping is kind of coming more into the, the rural areas. Um, so what else is not required for commercial that is required for, for, for residential is, is tax information. And there's certain things that are required on the residential side that's not required for commercial. You know, I wish my property tax bill looked like this. This is an exact copy of what our tax report looks like. And it's it's exactly what that current seller is paying for taxes on that current property. That's for sale, right? Your your property, your your Prop 13 taxes, the abnorm taxes, what the percentage it. And then every single assessment, your special taxes have been voted on by, you know, your local voters your mellow ruse, if there is, your 1915 bonds, mosquito abatements, flood control, and everything. And then also within the report is, is, is a tax estimator. So you can you can take what your the buyer, and the buyer should do this, not anybody else, what they're currently want to offer. And it's already going to have all the these taxes built into this estimator. 
And it's going to tell them what their new tax liability is going to be. You know, if they offer and pay this much, this is what their new tax liability is going to be. And also what their supplemental tax bill is going to be. This is information that's required by law on the residential side, but not on commercial. Very, very important. Now, I ask this, I ask this in every class. Melrose in 1915 bond is really what became, you know, Melrose became a bad word, you know, years ago, especially on the residential side. And that's why this became a law to disclose this because there's special things that happen with Melrose in 1915 bonds. The question, if you don't pay your property taxes, how long until the county can start foreclosure proceedings on you? Does anybody know? Okay, five years. So five years, the state of Riverside, if I wasn't paying my property taxes, uh, the Abalorum County taxes, especially, but you know, it's, 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 I'm not paying my taxes. The county after that, that fifth year can start foreclosure proceedings on my property. If there's a Melrose or a 1915 bond on the property, they can start within 90 to 180 days. Wow. So that is the huge difference and why and why a lot of this stuff doesn't translate over commercial. I think I kind of said in the beginning, it's it's, it's still kind of old school and it's buyer beware, do your due diligence. But Melrose and 1915 bonds don't just affect residential properties. They affect commercial as well. So there's accelerated foreclosure notices that are attached to Melrose and 1915 bonds. It's part of the language in there. And if you are having anybody's having a problem paying the property taxes, and we hear you can negotiate with the, the Melarus district themselves. If you're having a problem paying your county taxes and everything involved, we hear people have gone to the Melarus district and just paid the Melarus to stop that accelerated foreclosure from, from, from kicking in. You know, they still have the five years for not paying all the county taxes before foreclosure can happen by law. But Melarus 1915 bonds within 180 days is what most of the languages in these in these bonds see and Melrose 1915 if you don't know it's what the you know if I if I'm a subdivider I bought this big parcel of land um I'm gonna vote yes I want to put a Melrose on my property yep. and, and they use it to build schools green green walkways parks you know sewers different things that, that's the money and then they pass that on to the people that buy within that subdivision or, you know, the industrial and commercial are part of that, you know, they're the people that have to pay to keep this, you know, upgraded and keep those schools, you know, going and stuff like that. So it's very, very important on the commercial side to also know about this. So that's why we provide it in our report. You will see, we name it right here, Melrose Community Facilities District and how much it is. Um, but most people don't know that. I think when, every time I do this presentation, Sage, I... Somebody might try to answer it, but I don't think anybody in like 18 years has gotten the answer right that they knew it's five years or that they knew that there was accelerated foreclosure notices on Melrose and 1915 bonds. So very important to know, you know, I think people are having a hard time right now um, paying for things. People, are, we're starting to see an uptick in foreclosures and, you know, people not being able to pay for stuff. Um, very important to know if there's a Melrose and 1915 bond that there's an accelerated foreclosure notice attached to um, that. So Ruben, you had a question? Rob? Yeah. Uh, th so that acceleration for foreclosure applies to also to the commercial properties as well for Melrose? If there's a Melrose or 1915 bond on the property, correct. It's in the language. Okay. Yep. So that's why we disclose it in our commercial report too. So we don't want anything to come back. Say, you had a question? Yes. Um, I got a question. Doesn't Melrose expire after 30 years? All right. So um, typically 30 years is the range. We've seen them at 20 years, 15 years, 10 years as well. I think I've seen I've seen one at 40 years. Um, they typically do expire. And that's actually let's go to the next slide. So that segues right into it. If there is a Melrose or 1915 bond, this is required by law to also include on the residential side. And we include it on the commercial side. But it talks about what's in that Melrose or 1915 bond, how much it is. The maximum tax rate it can go up to so 2500 it can go up to 3800 on this commercial property the ending year and then also how much it can increase per year two percent so that's important to know that my melarus doesn't stay static it can increase two percent every year i've seen four percent i've seen five percent 
Um, I don't think I've seen anything higher than that. Yeah. So it's it's important information for the buyer of this commercial property to know that this tax rate is could continue to go up every year. And then that ending year per the question, um, yes, there is an ending year, but and this typically happens a lot more, I think, on the residential side of things. These were put into place to save the developer money, right? And that's why it became a bad word in the, the real estate industry. Nobody wanted to buy anything that had a mellow ruse attached to it. But no matter what the intent was, they're still paying for something that the the, the residences or the commercial complexes want to see. Those schools, those parks, those green belts to continually be maintained. That's what the money's paid for. So even though that the current levy is ending at a certain year, when that when that's coming up to be ending, there's a vote that's put to the people that have to pay for this bond. Do you want to extend this? Do you want this bond to be extended to continue to pay for these schools, infrastructure, that sort of thing? Um, typically, people vote yes. <laughs> they want to continue to see their, their stuff maintained. Um, so we typically hear that these things get extended beyond beyond the date. But there's also on the residential side, there's also a senior exemption. So a lot of these things, like I said, were built for schools. And, you know, most people when they reach, I, I believe I want to say it's 55, 55 or older, their, their children are out of high school and they they can go to the county and apply for an exemption to not pay for these Melaroos anymore. Um, especially, I believe, if the, the Miller Ruse was for the schools, that sort of thing. We've seen there's four or five, six <laughs> down in Temecula. I've seen six Miller Ruse on a property that paid for different things. It, it, it got crazy, you know, back when some of these uh, subdivisions were going up. Um, so they can be extended for sure. Um, it is a vote based off of the, from, to the people that are currently paying on the, the bonds, um, but they can absolutely be extended. So hopefully that answered your question. But this 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 uh, this assessment form is definitely provided for the additional information if those things are available. So what else? And this and this is the this is the main part of the commercial. You know the difference between us and everybody else out there. Uh, the environmental disclosure report. Um, when I first came to my NHD, they had a pretty good one. You know, they didn't just take, like I said, the residential, which is every other company has like the standard five or six environmental on the residential. And then they, they make that in their commercial report. My NHD had 11 and I told them that still wasn't good enough. I said, you know, I want this to look like what is what they see. If you don't know what a phase one, it's, it's for in the Rob, commercial world. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, I have a question in person before you go forward. Yeah. So one of the realtors here is saying uh, that she has a client that has a property. Uh, Half of the property is in Pasadena. Her garage is in San Marino and she has to pay property taxes towards Pasadena and San Marino school districts from Mela Ruse. Um, is there any way she can like go to the city or do something about that? That's her question, right? Well, the house is in Pasadena. Can you hear her? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. The it. house is in Pasadena. The garage is the San Marino side. The garage. Mm -hmm. So she's been. They've been there for over twenty years, and you know, recently I found out this. So. Um, um, I would absolutely. I'll be honest. I don't know if they're going to win, especially if they've been paying it for that long without any sort of fight. Um, that might go against the argument, but I would. I would definitely, I would definitely voice that, but they have to do that themselves. They actually have to go to the city and basically say, I'm paying for two Melaroos for the same property for two different counties. How does, or wait, Pasadena and San Marino. Right? So how does that, how does that work? Why, why am I paying this? And are, are they a certain age where they might be able to get that senior exemption? Yes. Then yes. I would definitely, I would definitely number one file for the senior exemption go to the city and file for that or the, the county and file for that. And then, um, you know, hopefully that just, that just takes care of both of them anyway. And if, and if not, I would, I would try and file a, I don't know what it's called. I don't think it's go, it's not called a complaint, um, but it's an argument. There's some legal term for it. I'm sorry. It's not coming to me right now, but um, I would file that complaint basically saying that it's, it's a, it's a tax fight. Oh God, what's the word? Um, 
anyway, I'll just use the word complaint. You file a complaint that you don't believe that this, this tax is reasonable or should be taxed on this property for these reasons. It's one property. Why am I being taxed for two different cities? So also, um, someone is recommending that you, the person, your client, could build an ADU in the garage and rent it out in San Marino schools. Oh, no, they have money. They don't, oh. <laughs> they don't want to do that. Okay, just a suggestion. Okay. Thank as you, Ross. As, yeah, you're welcome. As long as you're not in one of those you know, three zones and the, the city's not going to allow it. So you also got to look for that. So back to the environmental section. Um, I said that wasn't good enough. Um, a site inspection, you know, typically happens when it gets into escrow. If there's a lender on a deal, they're going to require a buyer, a commercial buyer to get a phase one and the buyer's got to pay for it. Very expensive just to start off with $2,500 and up. I, I hear um, we're not in that industry, but um, very expensive. And part of that is, is that phase one is called a historical record search. Um, that these environmental companies go out there and do or engineers go out in there and do. And the historical record search basically looks at that property and sees if there's anything being monitored on that property or different radiuses surrounding that property, a quarter mile, half mile, one mile around that property. And if there's anything being monitored and being cleaned up environmentally, that's going to concern a buyer. Okay, so that buyer pays for this report. It takes weeks. It's about 300 to thousand page report there's different things that go involved with it we wanted our report to be that red flag report right we we decided to give them basically what is the historical record search in that expensive phase one in our report um and here's what it looks like it's 28 state and federal databases so way above and beyond, you know, the other companies that just use a residential five environmental, you know, which is like super fun sites, underground leaky tanks, that sort of thing. Commercial has to be a lot more in depth um, as far as environmental issues go, um, just because there's a lot more going on, especially in a high density, you know, commercial industrial area. A lot of things are going on. A lot of these sites, you'd be surprised um, things that are leaking or getting spread out into the air or tanks are you know, leaking underground, that sort of thing. Um, we have 28 state and federal databases. It's going to tell you yes or no if it's being on the property or it's going to say the distance search from the property as well. Um, these are super fun sites where the big bad ones that are like brownfields. Um, it's going to landfills, chemical companies, leaking tanks, um, battery sites, toxic spills, um, everything that's going to be kind of in that historical record search we're giving you into our report for like a $20 extra, you know, we're near the $2,500. And again, this is, this is something you want to know at the time you get your listing. Are there things that my buyer or any buyer are going to be scared about, you know, are their employees going to potentially get sick because a quarter of a mile away, that battery company is being, being cleaned up. Is there liability on me? Because I knew that and I still purchased this property. You know, there and people can get scared about this, but in the commercial world, this is kind of standard to kind of screen for environmental issues. We want to make sure you guys have this information up front. This is what's being monitored. We made this a commercial centric part of our report. Um, it's it's very very important. I advise if one of my clients calls me and says they need a report, I automatically order the, the environmental section to come with it because I think that's important. And I've never had anybody come back at me and say, you know what, I really didn't want this, take it back. It's it's very, very important to them. Again, this goes back to the liability and no risk to you or your client. We get paid at escrow, no cancellation fees. Why wouldn't you want to know this on your commercial property at the time you get your listing? Oh, that's, that's something that's going to be something I need to talk about. I really need to disclose this to them. And again, we have our giant geologists on staff that can talk to your client a little bit more even more so than I am, I, I can't even talk to some of these environmental things. They're, they're a little bit more technical, but um, we have our geologist that can definitely go over it with a client that's scared about it. But each and every one of these that's in something is going to have what the site identification number is that's being mitigated, the website and phone number so that that buyer can call and say, hey, I see, I see the site is being cleaned up. Can you tell me more about it? I'm thinking about purchasing property close to there and they can get more information about what's going on. Um, if they want, you know, we have all the explanations about which 
what each one of these sites are, but they're very basic. And somebody might have more questions that our geologists might be able to answer for them. You know, what is what does a brownfield mean? And you know, what is what does this mean? And he can walk them through it a little bit, but it's still on the buyer, you know, to 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 do the additional investigation. But having this as that red flag information at the time you get your listing, we think is so, so important, especially on the commercial side. Um, we, we believe you should be getting that residential one as well, obviously. Um, but on the commercial side, this affects deals way, way more than it does the residential. So that's why I made my, my owner, I said, no, no, we are, we're 11's good, but we are, we are going beyond that. We're going to make sure that our commercial clients have what they're, they're needing to, to see what could be a potential red flag. So, uh, Ruben, you had a question. Yeah, just for our commercial agents or any agent, um, when ordering a report through my NHD, do these additional reports that are not just the required reports, are those just, uh, when they order a commercial report, are those going to be standard re uh, additional reports that are going to come with it? This environmental is an add-on. So okay. we, we, do have, we do have people that say, nope, you know what, I want that 80, I want that $99 report, or I'm sorry, $89 report. I still get it. You know, <laughs> Funny story, when I was on the residential side, you know, we get a lot of, especially a few years back, we got a lot of, nope, your competitor is $3 less, you know, either lower the price or I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with your competitor. And when I switched over to commercial, I thought that that would kind of go away because these are higher end deals, liabilities higher. That's why the pricing is a little bit different. Our liabilities a little bit higher as well. Right. Um, but darn, if, if there were a lot of people still saying, you know what? Nope, I only want that $89 report. I'm, I'm trying to save my client money. And even though I, I try and explain to them, but you know, liability, this environmental information is available, you, you might want to disclose that, right? So um, you know, there's still some people that don't want it. So we we don't make it mandatory that it's all automatically a part of our report because we got some pushback from some people on that. I think it's very important. You you do need to ask for the environmental section though, to answer your question. What 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 is that fee? Just so it's one oh it's one oh nine ninety five for everything. So it's still way below everybody else that provides an environmental report. I think disclosure sources is one fifteen. First Americans one twenty three ninety five. I don't know one forty nine. Um, so and their reports are nowhere near this as far as the data databases that are included. So 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 in essence, a hundred and nine. Call it one hundred and ten dollars. Right. For ten dollars more, roughly, you get all the reports. Yes, yes. We just yeah. we like I said, we got pushed back, and we we couldn't just include everything because some people didn't want it. So, but every time we talk about it on a residential side and especially on the commercial side, we're saying you you need to do this. It's just important for your liability. It's important to see if there's something that's going to concern a buyer and do it at the time of listing. There's no risk to you guys. Just get the report, have it updated if if it's gone beyond three months it's free it just there's just no reason not to and then you have it at the time of listing you need to make sure you give it to the invoice to escrow when it opens escrow don't forget that part of it it needs to be paid to have that liability protection so it's just all important all the way around i think ruben perfect so that's what that looks like. Um, again, we will answer yours or your client's questions to the best of our ability, but it is on the buyer to do some additional research. If they're concerned about something, they can go to that database, call that number, use that site number that's that will be included in the report. So this is a sample of what they're going to see. They're also going to get the map, right? It's, it's going to show the property in the middle. It's going to show the quarter mile, half mile, and one mile radiuses. Visuals are good. You know, that kind of drives home the point, right? So we have QR codes. Um, they can scan it with their phone. They can click on it on the computer. It's going to open up the maps. Visuals are key to really driving the point home. Look how many you know things that a buyer might be concerned about. It's going to have the the little list, the the legend at the bottom. Um, there's a lot of oil wells in this area. There's some underground leaking tanks. Um, you know these are the things that might concern a buyer. So visuals are are really key. So. Um, that will be there with every single one of our reports. And so kind of to tie things up, who's who should order the NHD report? It's the responsibility of the seller's agent to do this for their seller, right? Seller needs to disclose this. Seller's agent needs to help provide them this. The escrow officer can do it. God love them. I love my escrow clients. Um, I just advise people not to allow them to do it. Escrow, 
I, up up north, escrow won't even touch this. You know, they they basically say, nope, <laughs> I don't want any liability. If it didn't get ordered, you got to order it. It's on you. The law says it's the seller and the seller's agent need to provide this information. Um, down here, it became like a battle to get, you know, let's bring in more more business to our company. We're going to order these settlement services, the NHD, et cetera. Um, we love them. We just think it's so important to know sooner in the deal. Don't put your money, your blood, sweat, tears, getting this to escrow. And then you give them this right of rescission document and they have a reason to back out because something scared them or they had buyer's remorse or whatever. You gave them, you gave them the excuse to do that at this time. Know the information up front, no risk to you guys, no cancellation fees. Um, and if you represent the buyer, make sure you're asking that seller's agent for this report as soon as you can. They should have it, you know, at the time they have listing, but a lot of them, unfortunately, are still using escrow. Um, so get that information for your buyer as soon as possible. They should get it to you. I mean, our reports are coming out unless we need to eyeball something and something's close and we need additional tax information. Maybe our reports are coming out in like 10 minutes and being returned back to the client that ordered it. So very, very fast turnaround time. So how can we help? We got that quick and easy way to order it and receive it at myhd.com. The, the website is awesome. 24/7 ordering. We we have we have people working on weekends. We have a staff on weekends. We we know my mom is the most forgetful agent I think I've ever met in my life. She orders these reports on weekends. Um, we have the staff for you. Our customer service team and and geologist teams are are phenomenal. Um, we're here for you. We have the access to the combined hazard books for the commercial and residential. And the liability language protects all parties in the transaction. We're the only company out there that lists. We protect escrow, the broker, the aid buyer's agent, the seller's agent, the seller, the buyer. We name everybody that is in the deal that we will protect them from liability based on if we make an error in emission. Um, we've never had to use our, unlike some, a lot of these other companies, we've never had to use our you know, insurance. And we're very proud of that fact. Um, but know who you're doing business with. I, I know I, I, I fall into this category too, that I don't read the fine print of the things I buy a lot. Uh, most, of the, most of the companies require mandatory arbitration where you either got to go to Fresno or San Diego to arbitrate if you have um, a problem. We do not have mandatory arbitration. We're probably one of the only companies that don't. We resolve it in-house if we have to. And we haven't had to use our you know ever, right? So um, separate invoices and signature page and our toll-free number, obviously, for, for ordering the reports as well if you don't want to do it online. And every report is backed by $10 million of you know that we've never used from a California company, uh, not out of country, not out of state. You're not dealing with some, you know, who knows where some of these insurance companies are. Uh, we have Farmers Insurance, California-based company. Um, so it's, it's here if you need it. But thankfully, you know, we've never had to use it. We, we feel that we are that good. Um, we, we're paid through escrow, no charge for cancel orders. We talked about eighty nine ninety five for the NHD and tax, and then you add that env environmental that we talked about. That's so important. It's one hundred nine, so one hundred ten dollars out the door is going to protect you guys. And you know all the benefits of having the people in the back end to talk to the geologist Sage, who is an expert in her own right. You know she calls me the expert. I think she knows more than me sometimes. I just know a little bit more on the commercial side of things. Um, so we kind of already talked about this. You can do it, you know, any way you want, but contact myself or Sage, you know, uh, this is her number, right? Sage, I didn't get that wrong. 909-541-9740. Um, contact myself or Sage. We'll order it for you. We'll take it off your hands. You know, just, just send us, email us, text us the, the, the address, you know, and your, your information we should already have, hopefully, unless you're, you're new to us and we'll order it for you and get it taken care of. Um, that's what we're here for. Here's my information. Hopefully you can, I'll leave it up for a, a minute here. Uh, Rob Noble, I, I manage the division for the whole state. Um, I kind of bounce around all over the place. Um, I do have a, I do have a, a partner now, uh, Kara Duffy, who is Orange County in San Diego. That helps me out now, thank, thankfully, because I was pulling what hair I have left out of my head. Um, but <laughs> I see, I see Ruben, we go to the same barber. Um, I see, I see the resemblance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, Rob at myhd.com. That's my number at 951-532-6824. Um, I work on weekends. I, my phone is always on. My email is always answered. Um, everybody loves the fact I get right back to people. So call me, laugh at me, yell at me, whatever you need to do. Um, I'll help you guys out. 
And then the last thing I want to talk about is a new product um, that we did. Um, this has been asked for us from us for years. Um, it's a lease disclosure. So leasing is a huge part. Uh, we have a very, very large commercial brokerage that provides this on every single lease. And they're probably about 70% of their deals are leases and 30% are, um, are actual sales. So this is, this is basically protecting your owners and informing tenants about the potential natural hazards. There's liability in leasing now that we've seen lawsuits as well. Um, didn't tell me I was in a fire zone. You didn't tell me I was in a flood zone. I would have got renter's insurance. I would have done this. I would have done that. Um, and people that are leasing properties have been worried about liability. So commercial brokerages have asked, do you have something that can protect leaseholders? People are leasing their properties. So we put it together. And with the fires and floods, those are the two main ones, right? And on the residential side of things, it's mandatory to disclose if, to your renter if you're in a flood zone. So we have a renter report for the residential side that has flood zone and damnidation. You know, if there's going to be a, something wet that's going to happen to the property, it's been mapped out. It's required by law to give that to a renter. Nothing on the commercial side. Again, commercial is very much you're on your own a lot with these disclosures. And that's why we try and protect you. So this we decided, you know, not just flood zones and, and damnidation. We're going to basically give you all those state ones in one page. You know, the, the earthquake fault, the flood zone, the damnidation, very high fire, wildland fire, earthquake fault, liquefaction, landslide. We're going to provide this as a lease report to give to the leaseholder to give to their, their, their leasees. Um, it includes, like I said, those six and it's protecting the owners and it's giving those, those people that are renting the commercial properties a chance to go get additional renters type insurance if they want to. Okay. And there might be some liability if they don't disclose it. Right. It's not required by law. So it's something that, you know, it's not a huge thing, but a lot of people are starting to come on and order this um, as we talk about it. Uh, Rob, I hate to interrupt you, but yeah, uh, we are all, almost a half an hour over time, you know, it's oh. supposed to be one hour. I know you have a lot to talk about, but we, maybe we can uh, arrange at uh, another time uh, if you have more things to talk about. Is that Abs okay? Absolutely. This is, yeah, I, want, this, I don't want to uh, get all my agents, uh, you know. Yeah, but, I mean. Thank you guys so much. I do appreciate the people that came in person. So thank you so much. And I I think the reason I went over is because people were actually participating. So that's why I want to say thank you. I appreciate the conversation, the participation. I apologize for going over, but it's because we actually had a conversation today, which is wonderful. But thank you guys so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Ruben, Peter, and Rob, thank you. Thank I, you so I, much, Rob. Nice presentation. Thank you so I, much. I, I agree with with, uh, with both uh, Peter and, and Sage and Rob. But uh, if any agent has any questions, we're going to stop recording now. But if you do have any agents, uh, just stick around and we'll answer them. If not, we'll just uh, end the session and stuff. Uh, Edgar, if you want to go ahead and end the session. Rob, Sage, I really appreciate your presentation and all your uh, efforts to educate our agents. Uh, the main the main thing here, uh, agents, is order your NHD report uh, early 